Hello friends, welcome to our time of study for the middle of this week and hope you're well and uh, enjoying what appears to be the start of summer. Uh, we just sort of jumped right into it, didn't we? And uh, it's been an interesting week. We, we started uh, here in Mikester with a uh, full parking lot worship on Sunday, which was uh, fascinating to be a part of, uh, quite warm. Uh, we're planning on doing that again this coming Sunday, a little less warm. Uh, we hope you'll come at uh, a different time. We, Our Sunday broadcasts all along through this have been at 11. Uh, we thought maybe we would move back to our normal Sunday morning worship time of 10 a.m. for this Sunday. Um, might make it a little bit cooler than last week. But that will also get us in the habit of the, the following week when we're hoping to come back into the building the first Sunday of June, which would be at the normal time, 10 o'clock. I'll be looking for some, some email, uh, maybe some Facebook information from the elders uh, probably tomorrow on Thursday. Details about both those services and some, some of their thoughts about things. We move forward very carefully and uh, responsibly, but to move forward toward uh, uh, meeting uh, in a regular kind of assembly. I hope you will uh, look those things over carefully and, and cooperate as much as you possibly can. I know you will, um, but uh, if you're not a part of the Lancaster Church, we hope you're doing well. And, uh, and just a reminder on what we're doing in these these sessions we're studying through the uh, Old Testament book of Nehemiah uh, in a series called Let Us Rise Up and Build. And Nehemiah is the great builder of the Old Testament. He led Israel in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem after the great destruction that, that took place. And uh, we can learn great lessons about building and rebuilding uh, in a spiritual sense today from those things that, that they did successfully all those years ago. Uh, this is, I think, the 11th session. Uh, we're up to chapter 11, um, and uh, this session is, is entitled Some Things That Really Matter. And I hope it'll become obvious exactly what we're talking about as we open up the Word here in a few moments. Let's pray, and then we'll get into our study. Heavenly Father, uh, your blessings are great and, and beyond our being able to list and enumerate. Thank you for your love and care, your protection, your healing, and for uh, your guidance for us at all times. We're so grateful to be your people, uh, to be able to live with the name of your Son on us and help us to learn how to do so more faithfully. Uh, bless us as we study, as we open up your word, and help us to see those things that will make us more like Jesus and to make us more the church you want us to be. And so thank you for hearing us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, uh, if you want to open in your Old Testament to the book of Nehemiah chapter 11, we will read a couple of verses there in a few moments. Um, there is something that uh, I have said and I have um, heard it said, heard a lot of other people say it, a lot of other preachers at times. You've probably heard it. Maybe you've said it or thought it yourself. And it goes something like this. You see how excited and charged up people are at football games or concerts or political rallies, that ought to be how we are at church. And um, you know that or something like it is is used really to scold the church for having a wow deficit, let's call it, for for sort of suffering by comparison in our enthusiasm and our excitement um, when, when laid alongside some of these more secular 
venues. And uh, it's implied that because of this, we're in the wrong or we're doing something wrong. And really, the book of Nehemiah has helped me to see how wrong-headed that thinking is. And so I have repented of using that as a way to scold God's people for our comparative lack of thrilling and spine-tingling moments when we're together. Now, I understand the point we're trying to make when we use that comparison, and it's certainly true that we should not strive to be dull. You know, when we're together in our teaching, preaching, in our worship, we should not seek to bore our assemblies to death. Uh, after all, we do have the greatest message in the world um, to share with one another and to celebrate. However, there is a big difference between a church and a college football game. Uh, there is a great chasm separating the assembly of the saints and a rock concert and the work of God and the Republican or Democratic National Convention share little in common, I assure you. That's, that's just the facts. And so it has always been all the way back to the days of Nehemiah. Now, we've been working through this book. I've tried to encourage you to read it, and uh, maybe more than once, uh, although it is a longer book. And if you've been reading along, I'm sure you've noticed that there are some parts of it that are easier to read than others. Uh, in fact, you know, the book of Nehemiah has long sections of lists of names and places and all kinds of minute details that frankly are hard to read and study with great relish. They just don't tend to, to put a thrill up your spine like maybe some other passages might. Uh, popular passages like Psalm 23 or, or John 3.16, I mean, whatever your favorite texts might be. Uh, as an example, we took some time a few sessions ago to, to work through chapter 3 of Nehemiah. And in chapter 3, we have this long list of names of people who took trowel and sword in hand and labored at the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem and at the defense of the city from enemies. And uh, that, that particular chapter was full of names. And as we looked at that, I hope you saw that there were just some wonderful lessons, even in a chapter like that, in all the, the minutia uh, and the detail of that chapter, that could really shape us spiritually. So uh, let's, let's quickly review where we've been. It's been at least a week since we've talked about Nehemiah. In the first six chapters of the book, we have the story of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And then in the next four chapters, which chapters 7 through 10, you have a renewal of the worship of the people of Jerusalem. And these are often the chapters that we've maybe heard sermons or lessons on from this book, or people have written books about uh, from this book in the past. And so, you know, for example, the reading of the law by Ezra in chapter 8, where uh, the people stand up for hours and listen to the word of God. And then that great chapter of confession and repentance in chapter 9, and the renewal of the covenant promises by the people in chapter 10. But then we come to chapters 11 and 12, and we have there maybe a less exciting event in comparison, uh, but certainly no less important, because in chapters 11 and 12, the issue is repopulating the city of Jerusalem. Repopulating the city. Um, if you go back for a moment to chapter 7, and in particular in verse 4, 
it says there that after the walls had been built, rebuilt, um, you had an interesting situation in Jerusalem. That is, you have a city that has a temple, and it now has strong gates and sturdy walls, but nobody lives there. Chapter 7, verse 4, says this, The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. Interesting situation, isn't it? Uh, what use you see is a, is a rebuilt city and restored walls if there's no one to live in it. Sort of defeats the purpose of the project, doesn't it? And so in chapters 11 and 12, we have the details of repopulating the holy city, the city of Jerusalem. And so let's look at a couple of the verses that begin the chapter, actually verses 1 and 2, and, and see what it says there. Nehemiah 11, 1 and 2. Now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. It's an amazing process. Basically, a tithe of people is taken and those people are relocated from wherever it was they were living to Jerusalem. Ten percent, one way or the other, are assigned to repopulate the city. Some of them are chosen by lot, um, which in, in Bible times, in Old Testament times in particular, was thought of as God himself making the choice. It was a, a random process of choosing, but they felt that God was the one doing the choosing. For instance, there's a proverb that uh, reflects on this. Proverbs 16, verse 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. They thought that when you cast lots in order to make a choice, that God was doing the choosing. So, God's really involved in choosing who moves to Jerusalem. But also, it seems that many people of their own free will choice decided to move there. And they get this special praise um, for doing so, according to verse 2 that we read. You see, to move to the holy city at this time was not an easy choice and not an easy thing to do. It was dangerous. Uh, it might mean leaving where you had lived for a long time. It might mean leaving your nice farm in the countryside. Uh, so there were risks, both physical and financial. So those who made the choice to move are singled out for blessing and praise. And the blessing is specified there in verse 2. And then special praise is given to others later in the chapter in verse 6, uh, also in verse 8, and in verse 14. People are singled out for special praise for, for helping to repopulate the city. And so that's the way they went about filling Jerusalem with people once more. Now, uh, you might be saying, well, I'm missing your point here that you've been developing. I don't understand. If, if people are moving to Jerusalem, if the city is being repopulated, isn't that a good thing? Isn't it even an exciting thing? Wouldn't it be good and exciting if we started to see, for instance, the church filling up? growing, and in a sense being repopulated. Well, that would be thrilling. And um, so a person might 
be listening and, and say, why were you talking earlier about the church not being like a concert or, or a football game or a rally? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's the answer. Here's how it all fits together. If you think about how Jeru Jerusalem was rebuilt and restored and, and repopulated, how was it done, actually? It wasn't done with a party or a convention or a concert. It was done by a bunch of everyday decisions and actions by regular people whose names are listed here for posterity's sake, but they're never really mentioned again. Uh, read down through chapter 11, there are lots of names, most of them you never hear from before or after, except maybe for Nehemiah, whose name is there. And no one knows much at all about these names, but the, here they are in Holy Scripture. And what kinds of things were these names doing? these people. Well, nothing too exciting, really. Daily stuff. Uh, we have references to people who are praying and, and seeking God's will and choosing to, to sacri sacrifice perhaps a lucrative farm for a little house in the city. Uh, some of them are just stacking bricks one on top of another. Some of them, as we saw in another chapter, are standing holding a sword and keeping watch for enemies who were threatening them physically. Some were serving those who were doing so, no doubt. Maybe serving food. Maybe healing wounds when people got injured in this project. Some of them were priests. And uh, as they were going through this, they were offering sacrifice. Some of them were singers who offered praise. Some of them managed the gates that were built. Uh, some of them were government officials, civil servants. Some of them washed walls. Some of them served up in the temple. And none of those individual activities, you see, would cause anyone to stand up and cheer, probably. And none of them would elicit a shout or, or a rousing ovation. But every one of them was needed to rebuild and restore and repopulate the holy city. Every one of them. That's why these names are all here. That's why you have these family lists and these genealogies in this chapter, genealogies of the tribe of Judah and Benjamin and Levi. That's why you have all these different jobs and tasks and occupations that are enumerated verse after verse as you read through. And admittedly, it makes it difficult reading, but hopefully we're filling in the reason for this. And the reason is great. Each one had their role, their particular calling in this great work. And, and so it still is in the church of our Lord. Names, families, callings. These are things that really matter. You matter. Your name matters. It's important. Your family matters. Your role, whatever it is, your, your task, your job, your area of service, your calling in Christ matters. And the fact is, again, that almost none of those things that you do as you serve King Jesus would make anyone stand up and cheer. Uh, but if you don't do them, the kingdom suffers, doesn't it? And, you know, if, if your name is missing at church, the church loses. If your family is not an active part, then the effectiveness of the whole is lessened. 
think about something that the Hebrew writer said near the end of Hebrews, near, near the end of the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Uh, there he compares the church to a holy city. It's a really interesting text in Hebrews 12. He calls it the city of God. And uh, verse 22 of Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12 says to Christians, it says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You know, in a sense, when you become a Christian, you choose to live in Jerusalem, the holy city of the living God. And that choice means sacrifice. And it means hard work. And it, it might mean at times giving up some things that once dominated your life in order to serve a new king. You, you will no doubt uh, do some things in the holy city that most of the world finds no interest in whatsoever, that no one would ever pay to watch. And, and surely not a soul would ever stand up and cheer it. Very simple things. Most of the time unrecognized things. But you see, those are the very things that build and populate the holy city of today. That is the church of God, and the church of Jesus. So we think of a typical church and the kind of works that are done. For those of you who work in, a, in an attended nursery when we have them, or, or teach in Sunday school, or for those who count attendance or, or handle contribution, count that. Those who fix meals for those in need or help deliver meals, uh, those who get communion ready or, or, or push a broom or a mop or check to make sure the heater's working in winter or the AC in summer, those who run sound or uh, advance our slideshows and make sure the live stream is working or that volunteer who drives a van to help others go places maybe to, to come to assemblies those who care enough to take the lord's supper somebody who's not able to attend or or administer the bulletins or whatever it is be blessed today Thank you for living with us in the Holy City, for, for living with us in the church. Thank you for your service. And please learn today that without it, without your service, We might just be a building with walls empty on the inside. And please learn today that as we rise up together and build your name and, and your family and your calling is absolutely essential to our, our success. We cannot do it without you. I want to close with these words of Peter from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Uh, words really written for us today. It says there, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him along glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.